So since Jean isn't here, and so Mitch doesn't have to be the only one who speaks, I just want to talk to you about the little flyer that I put in everyone's binder, Finding Iron on the Moon. Something that I designed and put together myself, and it's actually mag really magnetic, so it's sticking to the whiteboard over there where the flip uh, of banner is. So check it out during the break. It's all about uh, magnetism for the young kids, and then about densities for the older kids. They can figure out that there's more iron where there are Maria because of the density of iron. And if you got the chance to see my sister Kristen's talk yesterday, um, she talked about haptics, which I thought was a misspelling the first time I saw it, because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and because Microsoft Word says it's a misspelling, but it's a real word, about touch and engagement with uh, our guests and activities. And so she had a wonderful volunteer, Brianna, and she's from the Maribel County School Planetarium. And so we also have that activity set up up front here. Um, there's pipe cleaners that you can make a bracelet out of the UV beads that were demonstrated during Chris's talk. So go ahead and make some bracelets and take them home with you, okay? All right, um, so here's Mitch Lumen gonna talk about calling the ISS, the Amateur Radio International Space Station Program. Pardon me while I whip this out. <laughs> well, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'd like to share with you two things. First of all, many of you know that for many years, the Evansville Museum has had a planetarium. And just recently this year, Indiana was graced with the launch of two brand new facilities one of which you all are very well aware of, having been here in Muncie. But in February in Evansville, we launched our planetarium. We had our state meeting there. And then I thought as a, an update, prior to presenting my presentation on the ISS amateur radio program, I'd show you what we built. This is what things looked like one year ago in Evansville. This is what it looks like today. We are operating a 40-foot dome with a 15-degree tilt, 70 seats, and Digistar 5. We're sited in a general museum of art, history, and science where we built a brand new enclosure right at the front door of our museum. The planetarium is inside this giant ball, which is covered with 1,500 tiles of Indiana hardwood. Uh, there is a door. You walk in. <laughs> you walk in back by the perfect little planet poster there around the end. Uh, like Ball State, our planetarium was hard to find. It was on the third floor. Many people thought the broom closet was the planetarium, but I think people know now where we are in Evansville. It's a great facility. Yes. A lot of things are serendipity or you just want to do them. When I heard in Evansville that one of our schools was going to contact the International Space Station using amateur radios, I just wanted to be a part. So I immediately ran over to the school and said, come and do it at our planetarium. It would be so cool. And they definitely agreed. As you might be aware, the uh, International Space Station has lots of radios on it. So the project involved a, a school, which is a private school in Evansville, amateur radio operators, of course NASA. There's a formal program in NASA called ARISS, which is the Amateur Radio International Space Station program, and you work for them and the planetarium. Like Dr. Slater showed us the other day, I'm just going to give you my conclusions right now. My only conclusion that I want to mention on the mic is, uh, why are you waiting if you can really do this? Okay. And the other thing is, is that you want to make sure when you talk to the International Space Station, you end your question with, over. 
they don't use TDRS satellites, they don't use lasers, they don't use real sophisticated technology to talk to the International Space Station on amateur radio. They just use radios that you can buy commercially. In fact, this is the radio we use to communicate with the space station. On the space station, on station, they uh, actually use a, a much smaller radio, and I'm just going to skip ahead and show you it. They use a handheld radio, like a walkie-talkie. <laughs> and it's plugged into an antenna, which is outside the space station, so uh, it gets good coverage. Let's go back. <laughs> the only way you can talk to the space station, and you will realize this if you haven't realized it already, the only way you can talk to the space station is when it's in your line of sight. When it's on the other side of the planet, it can't be done. You need relay satellites. That's where the TDR satellites come in handy because they can relay things around the planet to get to the ground stations. So you only have a short time to talk to them because they're flying at 17,000 miles per hour and once they hit your horizon, you can start chatting, they go overhead, you can keep chatting, and then they disappear over your horizon and you stop chatting. So we have a window of about nine minutes to say, hey, hello, International Space Station, and then it's goodbye. And then somebody else is talking to them if they're talking to anybody at all. Uh, this is not the astronaut we talked to, but I'd like to show you the plan and then I'll tell you about uh, Reed in just a second. Well, the things that we do are listed right here. Uh, you can see what they are. I'm not going to read them. The most important thing that I want to emphasize that you do if you ever do this, and it's real easy to do because all you have to do is test your equipment. You want to make sure it works before this happens because you don't have a second chance. And you, you could have a second chance if you rescheduled it, but I think after going through scheduling with NASA, uh, you won't want to do this twice because they give you four days and times when the space station is passing over you, and uh, they changed on us twice. I guess they had other things going on up there. I don't know what they do. So who are you going to call to do this? You can't do it alone unless you're an amateur radio operator. I know Wendina is an amateur radio operator, and some others might be here too. And uh, you could do it, but you really need, these are the guys you need to call. We have an amateur radio group in our town, and they came out and they did everything. I mean, these guys love what they do. They're so good to work with. So if you got an amateur radio group in your community, do call them because they'll love doing this. They came out about a week before and surveyed our roof. Here we are on the Ohio River. That's the old planetarium dome on our third floor. Some of you may have been under that dome before. We looked up there, hauled the equipment up, and we set everything up a week before. Why? Passed. So plan A was we used this uh, Yagi antenna, which is movable and steerable, basically pointed at where the space station is coming over your horizon, and you just kind of follow it as it goes overhead, and then it's a really great antenna set up. But that's plan A. You also want to have a plan B if you can, and they did have that. This is an omnidirectional antenna, and they had both of them set up, ready to go and tested. If one didn't work, we'd go to the other one, because this was important. When you work with NASA, you work through a formal program called the Amateur Radio International Space Station Program. They do all the legwork, they make all the arrangements, and they give you four dates and times. Some of the times may be late at night, some of the times may be early in the morning. Uh, you get to choose the, the ones you like the best, and they give you four of them, and that's the block. This is the astronaut we spoke to. Not all astronauts are available through this program. You have to have a license. And if there's an astronaut on board that has an amateur radio license, uh, they're eligible to speak to you. Uh, Reed was great. When uh, he came over our horizon, uh, he took our students' questions, he answered them. He was uh, very articulate, he was very interesting, and he's very, very encouraging to, uh, to kids from uh, you know, second grade to 11th grade, basically. So it was great talking to him. It felt like he was in our planetarium, even though he was just you know, hundreds of miles away. So here's kind of what the schedule looks like. You get the kids assembled, it happens, and then everybody goes. So I'd like to show you a few slides of how it went in Evansville back in late August of this year. Well, we already have the stuff on the roof, right? So the day before, they bring in the equipment for one more dry run. Everything works. They just leave it there. And so the next day, the kids arrive, and the stuff begins. We brought 
50 kids and 20 students, 50 kids and about 20 teachers to the school. The rest of us from to the planetarium, I should say, we're across town from the school. At the school, they assembled in their atrium and they had a school assembly where we Skyped the proceedings at the museum where I work. So with 50 kids in place, we already had pre-selected certain students to ask questions. Uh, we uh, had a lot of questions and we selected 10 questions with five backup questions in case we had extra time. We managed to get about 11 questions out. The mayor was going to come, but he was vacationing in Europe, so the, the chief of staff came and gave us a proclamation. One of the students served as a master of ceremonies. He was a lot of fun. Students all queued up. It's also important that the students practice their questions before, and you have to keep reminding them to say, over, <laughs> because we were using a microphone. Minutes. We waited for the contact. They came over the horizon somewhere over Oklahoma. We said, hey. Uh, they lined up, they asked questions. Some of the questions were the, the typical questions that you might think of as the outcomes again, like uh, how do you go to the bathroom in space and what time zone do you use? But they were very interesting questions. And I know I just have two minutes, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to try to waste all my two minutes by not taking questions and see if I can play something that I had had happened in last night in my hotel room. I'm down here, I've ducked down. And I'd like to play you a little news clip if I can get this to, to work down here with IEP. <laughs> From the news station, and I'll probably end up answering 30 seconds of questions here. So you don't really want to have another break, do you? Wouldn't you rather watch this, this short little news clip? Thank you. Thank you. You're going to let me take some questions. You really got to do this if you have a planetarium because it's something you got to do. <laughs> what was the best thing you learned from this? Over. <laughs> Wow, you learned fast. <laughs> the best thing I learned from this is that, and this is the reason you have to do this if you got an amateur radio group in your community. I did nothing. I, I let them in, they did everything. The school, the teachers, if you work in a school, you'll have to do some work, but the teachers did all the work, they bust them there. I came, I came to work, everything was working. I just stood in the back and it just happened. 
And I was amazed, I didn't do anything. It was the easiest day of the whole week. <laughs> so the thing that I learned is it takes no work at all if you work in a museum and not in a school. <laughs> How about another, or we just do our break? Oh, Chuck. Uh, have you seen some return visitors talking about it? Over. <laughs> I know, they're, they're quick learners. Thank you. And I will finish mine with an over, too. Um, I really haven't. I would like to say that I have. Whenever you get on the news, that's a good thing, and especially when it's good news. We do have a lot of students that were exposed to the museum, both at the assembly at school, and of course we had 50 kids coming here. But I mainly did it, Chuck, for the, for the kids and for the teachers, because this was something that they wanted to do. It wasn't my idea. I heard about it, and I pretty much controlled the situation by saying, we'll host it. So being a host was pretty much all that I, I provided over. <laughs> Damn. What did the amateur radio people think of this? Do they want to do it again? Because a lot of times they get caught in something. The amateur radio group, this was, I asked them the day of, I said, have you ever done this before? And they said, no. But I had confidence in them. Uh, they definitely do it again. Uh, they spent a lot of time doing this. It's all their equipment and all their time. Uh, they love doing this. They just simply love doing this, and I'll leave it at that, over. So um, thanks everybody for presenting and round of applause for the presenters.